And welcome to a very special edition of the Hank Unplugged podcast. This is, well, it's the 100th episode of Hank Unplugged. And today we're going to feature a very close and personal friend. And he really fits the billing for our mission statement because he is truly one of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people on the planet. He has a tremendous vision, and I want you to catch that vision today. But before I introduce my guest, I'd like to take just a moment to look back at some of the guests and topics and, well, listeners that have led us to this moment. Remember, Hank Unplugged was the brainchild of my son, David, and it debuted back in the summer of 2017. At that time, I had just been diagnosed with stage four mental cell lymphoma. And yet, being in the hospital, going through chemotherapy, we still were able to do all of these podcasts, almost 100. Today is going to be number 100. And we've had nearly a half a million downloads across dozens of platforms, iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and everywhere else popular podcasts are consumed. And so many five-star ratings have come in, I just can't count them. Uh, David gave me two just a moment ago. One says, fresh perspectives from a familiar voice. Hank Hanegraaff has hosted the Bible Answer Man broadcast for over 30 years, but this is a very different format which provides a more intimate and deeper exploration of issues and ideas with very significant guests. Another says, a great podcast. I really like this podcast. I personally benefit from it, and I appreciate Hank's honesty. I really like that he brings a diverse group of believers together, and he helps people grow in Christ, to quote a great man, in essentials unity and non-essentials liberty, and in all things charity. By the way, that's not original with me, but we certainly have popularized that motto. Hank Unplugged has, of course, featured guests throughout the Christian traditions from Nathan Jacobs and Bradley Nassif and Frederica Matthews Green to Lee Strobel and Gary Habermas and Jack Graham, Frank Beckwith, Jay Richards, and Marcellino D'Ambrosio. <laughs> what a name. And this was a book, by the way, that I was turned on by my guest today. We'll talk a little more about that as the podcast continues. But, of course, this podcast has covered a wide range of topics from my battle with stage 4 mental cell lymphoma to Eastern Orthodoxy to intelligent design, biblical sexuality, black Hebrew Israelites, Islam, the early church fathers, and most recently, the novel coronavirus COVID-19. But all of this is just prologue to episode 100. Again, wow, 100. In the words of my father, who died when he was 74, which is something that I have in common with my guest today, his father also died at age 74. My dad used to say, that's not nothing. So we do something extraordinary, he'd say, that's not nothing. So without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce you to my dear brother, my friend, my co-labor in Christ, Brother K.P. Johanan. He is a metropolitan. He is the founder of Gospel for Asia. There's a whole lot more that I'm going to say in a moment, but welcome, K.P. Thank you, Hank. What a, what a privilege. It's amazing just to hear the narrative of your journey. And many of the names you mentioned, I know them, and I'm so grateful that Christ's name is known far and wide, and uh, the influence is very significant. And uh, for me, I tell people everywhere in the world, one of the greatest privileges in my personal life is uh, the day I got to see you and know you and um, follow you, and I appreciate you so very much. 
Well, I love you too. You know, you're one of those people, and I've told many people about this. Of course, my son David experienced it because he was in the room when it happened. When we first met, the minute I saw you, I can say I truly loved you. And that has only grown over the years. Yeah, the same thing. You know, Christianity is, uh, sad to say, um, has... Uh, what A.R.W. Chaucer, you know, said it um, about many things about church, the missing jewel in the modern Christianity for a long time, it is the understanding of mystery. And I never forget the first time I uh, saw you, uh, I mean, for me, for years, if somebody said, um, did you ever meet Hank Hanegraaff? Uh, you talked to him? Um, my answer would be, what on earth are you talking about? I never even imagined that could happen. So when I saw you, it was like uh, a hidden mystery that all of a sudden the light turned on that God in his amazing uh, eternal plan uh, now uh, opened the door and here I see you face to face. I mean, it's, it's not um, an illusion. It's a real thing. And my heart was pounding is so harsh and hard, thinking that, my goodness, I didn't know this was going to happen, but here I am uh, meeting you. And I, I think when we are in eternity, that is the future, we look back and see uh, how different times in our life, uh, whether deep uh, pain and sickness or encounter, meeting people, uh, I think we will see all things as they are. And this was one of those moment, um, moment that I think uh, my meeting you and the joy of knowing you and it, it continue to increase in its value, appreciation and um, understanding the ways of the Lord. So I, I just want to affirm that and thank you again for your love and friendship and our journey together for this brief few years left uh, in the light of eternity. Yes, both of us are on our fourth quarter. I mean, even if we live to be 100, we're still in our fourth quarter. So yeah. we're, we're looking to make our lives count while there is yet time. And you have done so much in ministry. And obviously, you're a humble man. And I don't want to exalt you unduly, but I do want people to know how God has used you, first of all, as the founder of Gospel for Asia. This is an organization that has helped to bring the love of Christ to literally, without any hyperbole, millions of people in a needy world. You're also, and I think this is very significant, something we'll talk about in the podcast, but you're the Metropolitan of Believers Eastern Church. And this church has more than 12,000 congregations. Think about that for a moment. 12,000 congregations in 16 nations, nations around the world that I think encompass some 300 languages. And George Verwer, who is, of course, the famed founder of Operation Mobilization International, dubbed UKP, the Indian Apostle Paul of this generation. And I think he's absolutely right. You're the author of the bestseller, Revolution in World Missions. It's a book that more than any other has changed the way world missions is impacting the precious planet for which Jesus Christ sacrificed his life. There are some, this is a staggering number, some 4 million copies in print, probably many, many more in languages all throughout the world. And that book, again, has been dynamic in changing the very way in which world missions is being conducted. And this has made a big impact in and of itself. So let me stop there. There's much more that I could say, but first of all, Talk about Gospel for Asia, an incredible ministry that has had such an impact around the world. Um, Hank, thank you. Uh, thank you for being very kind and gracious in the way you said things about me and the ministry and the work and the church. You know, when I first came to America in 1974 to go to um, the seminary in Dallas, 
people used to ask me, uh, tell us about the place you come from and um, what is it like? And I used to tell them, well, why don't you go and look at the oldest black and white uh, Tarzan movie you can find. You might have a, a glimpse, understanding of the community or the tiny uh, rural village I was born and raised. And strange enough, those who study theology and uh, seminaries, they will learn the word niranam, N-I-R-A-N-A-M, because uh, that is one of the places where St. Thomas, Apostle Thomas, Christ's disciple, came in AD 52, preaching the gospel, uh, obeying the great commission of the Lord to go into all the world. And uh, he planted seven churches. And one of those churches, Hank, happened to be about three kilometers uh, from where I was born and raised. And, um, you know, being raised in a, a Christian home, uh, believing in the Orthodox faith and the holy traditions and following the Lord, my mother without any doubt, was truly a living saint. And now we make saints after they're dead. But um, my mother, about five feet, one inch tall, something like that, a tiny woman, uh, you know, she had six sons, and I'm the youngest. And um, uh, she was so devout uh, that she would spend four or five hours daily in prayer alone. And she looked into her eyes as a small boy. I thought, what is wrong with my mother? Because she had a different, strange world uh, stamped into her eyes. And um, when I finished my high school, um, I uh, told my parents, um, if they would allow me, I'd like to go with a youth group to uh, North India, which is 2,000 miles away from my village, to learn about Christ uh, discipleship and then share the gospel with people that never heard it. And before I could finish my sentence, my mother, who was sitting on the bench uh, by our dining table, jumped up um, and said, go, you must go. And my first impression, Hank, was, my God, I was an accident or she never liked me. Um, but there was no other conversation. Uh, sure enough, with their blessing, um, I went off to North India. And two years of my life in um, Rajasthan, um, known as the desert of the uh, kings of the gospel, um, I came home, skin and bones, and um, uh, trying to visit my parents. And my mother was in the kitchen cooking. Uh, you know, like the old way, the firewood and, you know, the stuff. And, and she said, uh, I won't tell you a story. Why don't you sit down? So I sat down and she said, you remember the day you came and told me about you want to go and serve Christ? I said, yeah, Mother, I remember that. I know also what you said. She said, well, there's something you don't know. And then she said, all my life I prayed that one of my sons will commit his life to serve the Holy Church and uh, serve the Lord. And uh, one by one, your brothers went to farming business and all kind of things, uh, because I come from a farming family. And um, you were born and raised timid, shy, withdrawn. I kind of gave up my hope that you would make anything out of your life. And that's when I started praying every Friday fasting, only drinking water for three and a half years, saying, Lord, before I die, please call one of my sons to serve you and the Holy Church. And the day you came and um, said what you said, I knew instantly God answered my prayer. But I never told you that because I never knew that. And, um, of course, um, you know, uh, I'm convinced uh, that uh, my serving God or going out to be his uh, had to do with my mother's prayer. But then I learned later uh, from my church that when I was taken to be baptized and chrismated, uh, my mother told our priest uh, of my six sons, this one we have decided to uh, give to serve the Lord and the Holy Church. Please, uh, Father, pray for him uh, that it will be fulfilled. 
And um, so it is amazing those records are kept. But then, Hang, one of the amazing things, in 1990, I was on the way to South Korea to speak uh, at a mission conference from the United States and uh, in August. And that's when I heard my mother was taken ill and taken to the hospital. She was hardly ever sick in her life. And I canceled my trip and um, uh, went down to South um, to visit my mother and she was 84 at that time and um, the day before she died she told the medical doctors that tomorrow I'm going to be with my Lord and she would be witnessing all the time about uh, knowing Christ and all that anyway next morning 6.15 she um, uh, departed to mm. be with the Lord and after her funeral we will open her diary uh, look at the instructions she left with her sons. And one of the things she wrote down was this, when I'm dead and gone, the only thing I will leave behind, it is my wedding ring, my earrings, and the gold chain my husband gave me when I was 19, when he married me. Please sell these items and give the money to preach the gospel where people never heard Jesus' name. I want to meet them also in heaven. The amazing thing, we sons, we all thought she had a huge amount of money saved up in the bank to find out there was nothing. She was giving away all her resources continually every month to preach the gospel in many, many places without ever telling anyone. And um, when I came to serve the Lord with Operation Mobilization and spent eight years of my life in India, Bangladesh, and uh, Indonesia, and all these places, but finally in 1974, when I came to America to study in seminary, after a few years of my training here, of course, you know, I mean, 500 years of training is a long time, uh, I felt so empty, so lost, um, saying to myself, what am I doing in America? This is a country where every telephone post is a church. Two billion people live in South Asia that never heard the name Christ. And uh, that's when I resigned from my church being a local clergy and um, decided to start the mission, um, Gospel for Asia. And um, now we are 40 years in the uh, history. And um, our job was to train people in their own countries, cultures, and send them out to preach the gospel among people that never heard the gospel. And that was a beginning, I mean, just like Jesus did in Gospel of Matthew chapter 28, and then what happened in Acts chapter 2 and Acts 13. And so, you know, I'm, I'm totally amazed as I look back. Um, I've been like, hang honestly, like a dry leaf carried in the wind. Didn't know what the future, what to do, where to go, but good and bad and pain and agony and uh, persecution, whatever, the Lord carried us. And here we are, um, amazed by what God is doing and um, the Holy Church and what the Lord is planning in the days to come. I want to jump ahead just a little bit based on what you said with respect to Gospel for Asia, your vision, your passion. You have said, and I've heard these words come out of your mouth, that there's a deception that has taken place within mission organizations, and that deception is that they fail to see that they are, in fact, a means to the end of establishing local churches. And so you have seen your mission not as a mission just to reach out, as significant as it is, but to build the church because you are committed to 1 Timothy 3.15, what Paul said, that the church is the ground and the pillar of truth. And now you've established over 12,000 churches, and that's being conservative. You're understating the numbers on purpose, because if you overstate, people can say you overstated by one. It may be many more than that, but 12,000 churches plus and these are in 16 different nations and encompass so many varied languages. Talk a little bit, KP, about your total irrevocable commitment to the church as the center of the universe, that out of which everything else springs. Well, 
uh, Hank, uh, this journey of uh, my understanding of the Holy Church and the mystery that was hidden in God, uh, the Holy Trinity revealed to St. Paul, um, I, I want to be uh, very blatantly honest that I did not understand it uh, for a long time. And I, uh, you know, it was about 17 years ago, I actually began to uh, begin to understand the amazement and the mystery of the Holy Church. My education and background in the United States, everything was heavily Protestant, and uh, church history went back to Martin Luther, nothing more than that. And um, information uh, to me, I mean, honestly, and I, I would say this uh, with what our humility I can muster up. That is, if we can find a lawyer to defend God and uh, theology, I would be one of the um, rare ones, I think. It was all in my head. And um, uh, finally, when I realized this God I talk about is uh, somebody I obey every word and like Pharisees, but it's like looking at a beautiful rose flower. It's incredibly intoxicating the scent of it. But uh, as C.S. Lewis said, we cannot enter into the reality of the incredible scent, the smell. So it was for me uh, when I read Second uh, Peter chapter 1, 4, that we are called to be partakers of his divine nature. And that threw me off completely. And I said, where is this God? I talk about him. I pray uh, even better prayers than Peter Marshall, and I can explain everything, but I can't touch him. I can't. Where is he? And that was the beginning, Hank. I began to, uh, with the recommendation of someone to read Sadhu Sundar Singh and Watch My Knee and uh, the early church fathers, I call them Orthodox fathers, and the apostles and uh, what they said. And uh, they didn't write books to get money. They just, you know, uh, spoke the amazing realities they experienced through the mystical encounter with the living God. And this is when I realized, you know, I had written over 100 books by now, and um, Revolution World Missions became the most impacting book in the world. Everything was going so well. But then I went back and began to read the Great Commission. And what Jesus said, Go, therefore, I'm, I'm, I had I'd done the job. Go and preach the gospel and those who believe, baptize them and then teach them everything I have told you. By the way, I'll come back finally. And that's what he said. And that actually shocked me to no end. That is evangelism without a specific laser being focused to establish the authentic church where the Eucharist is the epicenter of worship and the living Christ presence. We are missing something. And so I realized what a massive deception Lucifer and billions of demons have inflicted upon the modern church. And I, I don't want to be a critique or attacking anyone, but Jesus spilled his blood on the cross hang for the church. And uh, Bill Heimer, in his classic book, Destined for Throne, he said this, the reason for the entire creation, the billions of galaxies and the earth and everything, the purpose of God was to find a bride for his son, and that is the Holy Church. And if that is the purpose, when St. Paul said, I suffer all these things for the sake of the elect, and if people <laughs> don't know what I'm talking about, they should read Second Corinthians. This was like a man bleeding for 30 years and his trail you can see the blood drops, and he did all that for the sake of the elect, for the sake of those who become the members of the Holy Church. That's what he lived for, and that's what Jesus died for. And this conviction 
not only change my heart so completely, Hank, I began to uh, spend day and night. I mean, by the mercy of God, I learned speed reading, which is a good thing. So I don't know how many thousands of books and materials I would read to understand the early church and the traditions and why they did what they did and all that. So I have come to this conclusion, which people should forgive me if I'm off track from their thinking, a mission, whatever it is, social work, feeding the poor, hospitals, um, developing a poor community or nations, whatever, if we are called to fulfill the Great Commission, if deep within us, we don't have a commitment to see a local church established. We have failed in the Great Commission of the Lord Jesus Christ. I do not mean we should not feed the poor and hungry. I know Hindus. I mean, recently a Hindu man gave 7 million Indian rupees to one of our priests to feed the coronavirus affected poor people and Muslims. So doing good things, Peace Corps people. And um, America possibly is the greatest nation in the history of mankind, I think, people that are so kind and gracious and giving and loving uh, suffering people. And the tsunami um, history shows that very well. 90% of all the finances ever given by any country, it 90% came from America. So you don't have to be a Christian or part of the Holy Church uh, to be kind-hearted and giving. It's the nature of God, and Americans are known for that. And I thank God for that. But doing what the Lord Jesus Christ said in the light of eternity you go and preach the gospel, but that is not the end of it. No, the, the social work and everything we do, we must do much more than we are doing, but that should be a means to express uh, the love of Christ as Mother Teresa many, many times said to people when they asked, Mother, why on earth do you do this? You are cleaning the wounds of the lepers with your own bare hand. And she responded, I'm doing it for Jesus. This person with leprosy is Jesus. Because of the love of Christ, I do it. And so I'm not saying we should not help the poor and needy. We should much more. But here's the thing. Life or not is, and as Hang, you said, uh, we both are of the same age. And I said to myself, 25 years, 100 years and now, what does it matter? And I think... Honestly, Hank, the greatest tragedy of humanity is people who claim to be Christians don't think life here on earth is not permanent. This coronavirus, I hope, made everyone realize whether you are a billionaire or a beggar, life is very short. Death is part of life. But we are called by the living God created by him to be reconciled to him and to be with him forever and ever where is no time and being part of the holy church is where we understand the mystery of deification or becoming and learning to have the nature of God which in life we experience and also after we depart from this life. And that is music to my ears. In fact, it is the thesis of my book, Truth Matters, Life Matters More. It's a whole lot more than being a lawyer, as you put it just a few minutes ago, a lawyer for Christ. You have the opportunity to be a participant in the divine nature. You know, most people don't understand. You know, Western culture, unfortunately, our theology at large is you know the truth and that will make you spiritual or you don't do bad things that make you obey God or you do the right things. Uh, that means you know God. But, you know, that is not true. Cornelius, in the book of Acts, we find he was doing good things and God acknowledged that. And so, you know, we evaluate God and relationship with good and bad. And, you know, the strange thing, <laughs> you know, St. Peter was the greatest of all apostles that God picked to build his church on. And here, Jesus said, Peter, Satan wanted to destroy you. But I prayed that 
your faith will not fail. Jesus could have said, I prayed that you will not be tempted and you will not be um, going through pain and agony and um, uh, guilt and um, uh, want to kill yourself like Judas did. But I prayed you will not lose your faith in the loving, gracious God who uh, is not so worried about um, your failures or your success. And the beauty of knowing God and partaking of his nature is this, hang honestly, where is God? Please show me God. Help me understand him. And um, Jesus would say, well, if you see me, you see in God. But what are you like? And Jesus is one uh, who says to the woman uh, who was caught in adultery, my daughter, I don't ask you one question. Go in peace and your sins are forgiven. The sick man who was 38 years awfully sick because of his wrong living, Jesus would heal him and would not condemn him. But he say, son, just don't do that anymore. Go in peace. You see, God is love, not just that he loves everyone. He is love. And so the pure Orthodox faith of the fathers, they never went around condemning people and criticizing people and using the media to abuse one another and social media and all these things. But they simply said the wicked man today could be a saint 10 years from now and love is the greatest of all doctrines. And um, when we understand that, I think the manifestation of Knowing God is humility and nothingness. And you know, honestly, one of the greatest discoveries of my life, by God's mercy, is learning about the Jesus prayer. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I have this orthodox um, you know, prayer rope that I pray hundreds and hundreds of times a day, which Help me understand how great and awesome this holy God is and who am I? Nothing and nobody and his mercy is all I have. And when we understand this and communicate this love to the world, whether they are Hindus or Muslims or whatever, finally they understand, you know, God cares and he loves. And that's the reason why I think Every community, our missionaries are going, you know, I just heard about um, a church in the foothills of Himalaya uh, where our missionaries had to walk seven days to get there from the uh, final bus station. And there's a church with some nearly 100 families uh, that, you know, came to know the Lord and now um, baptized and cremated and they partake the Holy Eucharist. And without the priest, they are telling these uh, believers, they themselves walked up six hours to the higher mountain region and began to share the changed life they experienced and they started a new church in their community. This is spontaneous. This is Acts 1.8. You can't help but uh, tell others uh, what is happening to you. So when you say 12,000 congregations, you know, hang honestly, that's true. We have, um, you know, thousands and thousands of more and we don't talk about it. But there are countries, hang, we work, we don't declare, we don't talk about it, we don't write about it because of security reasons. But people are coming to know the Lord. But it is very important. Evangelism should not become the full stop. Evangelism is 5% of the work. 95% is establishing them in the holy church and teaching them. This is what I am very concerned about. You know, when you say America and Europe, we are post-Christian nations. I weep. I mean, I honestly, I'm not joking about it. My heart hurt. I've been here 40 years and think about the shallowness and the lack of understanding of God and um, all that goes with it. It has to do with, you know, like a bulb which is perfect, but there's no electricity in it. It don't shine. And um, uh, doctrines and right teachings don't make people godly. And this is possibly one of my greatest concerns for the body of Christ in the West. When I talk to you and I hear your vision and your passion and the reach of gospel for Asia, there's sort of a flip side that I'm thinking about as well. 
And that is gospel for Asia is a threat. And what I mean by that is that there are colonized nations that were ruled by the British who see converts to Christianity as the means by which Western nations are going to control their countries. And so when they see a mission organization establishing churches, making a difference like you are, for example, in the Indian culture or in Myanmar, they see your organization, the organization that God, by his spirit, allowed you to found, they see that organization as a threat and they don't lay down for that threat. They want to eradicate that threat. And so a whole movement was started against you because of what you're doing in terms of reaching people in an age in which internet lies travel halfway around the world before truth has had the chance to put its boots on, to paraphrase Mark Twain, You've been vilified and you have really paid a price. And I saw that in a book that I've made available to our constituency. In fact, we're promoting it all this month at the Christian Research Institute, a book titled Never Give Up. It's the story, and I love the subtitle. It's the story of a broken man impacting a generation. When I first read this book, and I did an endorsement for the back cover, when I first read this book, I was so moved, so touched. I have gone through some of the same things that you've gone through, maybe on a lesser scale, but gone through those same things. And so when I read this book, I thought my endorsement on the back cover ought to be God brings certain books and people into our lives precisely when we need them. And then I say, Never Give Up is one of those books, and K.P. Yohanan is one of those people. His passion to change a generation is as inspirational as it is instructive. But in this book, K.P., you bear your soul. You talk about what it is like to be a target of the devil and his demons. You went through a process that literally broke you, and you talk very transparently about that and never give up. Well, Hank, here is, um, you know, I'm so glad to hear the way you explain this. This is so plain and simple. You know, for a long, long time in my service of the Lord, it's 50 years of serving God now, you know, I thought suffering and persecution was so much physical um, accusation, abuse, or people beating you up. Because when I was barely 20 years old, I was beaten up, severely stoned for preaching the gospel, just as we read in the book of Acts. But, you know, sad to say, the thousands of clergy, priests, and uh, pastors in America and Europe that are giving up their ministries, resigning, quitting everything, and this is very public. Uh, I just talked to one yesterday who was a full-time pastor of an evangelical uh, Protestant church for over 10 years, he resigned, not because of immorality or he did something wrong. Um, He said, I couldn't handle the abuse of people in the congregation, no matter what I said, the accuse and abuse and all that. And people don't understand this is the price we must pay for the delivery charge of this gospel to the lost world and to the people of God. And read Acts chapter 20. Uh, people, forget this, St. Paul, the the one I think next to Christ, the greatest human being walked on earth, with all the revelations, he talks about his suffering in Second Corinthians. So for me, I did not understand fully what it says in Peter that Jesus suffered for us leaving this example that we may follow in his footsteps. And as you very well said, you know, many, many years ago, I think about 25, 30 years ago, when George Werwer came from England to visit our uh, U.S. headquarters in um, Carrollton, Texas, when the meeting was over, he called me aside and said something very personal. He said, um, KP, I just want you to know you are set 
up as number one target of Lucifer and demons to destroy you because you are involved in world evangelism and reaching the lost world. And he said, I'm praying for you. And okay, I heard that. I understood the persecution, different things like But Hank, uh, when we began to plant churches and establish the authentic churches, that is where I saw the organized persecution as something I never understood before. You know, people with multiplied millions and billions would give their money to plan a strategy to kill, destroy, shut down mission organizations, especially those who plan churches in some of these Asian countries. India was no exception. And um, uh, that began 10 years ago. And um, the sad thing is uh, they use their money and resources to instigate some um, well-meaning Americans to attack us with allegations and things I never imagined. And you know, I cast out demons and prayed for the sick uh, hundreds of times, and it all was so simple. But all of a sudden, I was faced with such uh, mental pressure, emotional stress, uh, that I just couldn't handle it. And um, I you know, talk about in the book uh, that I thought the best way to get out of everything was to kill myself. Honestly, I could not find anything I have done wrong to deserve uh, this kind of massive attack. Uh, The social media, the blogger, and all these things. And the problem was our legal uh, systems, uh, people told us we can't respond to anything, just be quiet and don't open your mouth. And so three, four years we went through with closed mouth but suffering intensely. But I must say this, I was learning practically what I've been reading and walking in for 15, 16 years of sharing in the suffering of Christ, as St. Paul talked about in Philippians 3. And um, um, and I so desperately wanted to write a book about it, but then I didn't have emotional strength. Then I prayed and prayed, and then the Lord gave me um, uh, an answer um, after months said, read Second Corinthians. And I would read it. I thought he said, read it one time. You know, he said, read it again, again. I do not know how many times I read it until finally the light turned on. St. Paul didn't write Second Corinthians to defend himself, to fight how right he was, but talking about his uh, deep pain and suffering in serving his master. And uh, that's when I understood, now I can write this book. And I wrote this, the journey I made four years, which I think since the book been released, the hundreds of people write back or call and say, you know, they've been going through something like this or similar, and they didn't know how to handle it. And so this is uh, where I think our uh, Western church, uh, I don't say this negatively, Our training is you pray, God is great, he'll bless you, heal you, give you millions and uh, the prosperity gospel preachers and all those things. And, you know, I heard a preacher long ago saying, uh, Abraham was a multi-billionaire and you are the children of Abraham. You should be claiming billions. But these fellows have no clue Abraham lived in tents. He could have built a mansion, a ten mansions for himself, but he never did it. In Hebrews it says, he lived in tents, saying to himself, I'm a pilgrim and stranger on this earth. And he looked for a city that has foundations and the builder and maker is God. And um, Jesus died on the cross, not leaving mansions and houses and properties and lands. He just had one pair of clothes he was wearing. And this gospel of prosperity and knowing all the doctrines correctly, believing and having a wonderful life on earth is not the gospel or the living God that we read in the Holy Scriptures, nor communicated to us by the fathers of faith. And I am saying these things not with anger or any kind of hate, but I am desperately, emotionally hurting for Christian leaders and pastors who make their living by peddling doctrines and having moral life, not understanding 
this is not what God intended for us to be like here on earth. What you believe not only about what the Apostle Paul said in Second Corinthians, but what we read in the book of Acts, you believe that that is relevant. In fact, not only relevant, it is the blueprint by which we ought to do missions. And even more than that, it is the blueprint by which we are to live our lives. And so if you really want to understand what our legacy ought to be, not only in terms of our personal lives as we stand before the Lord, but the legacy we leave in terms of reaching the world, you say, read Acts and read it again, and read it again, and read it again in much the same fashion that when you were going through your own anguish, you kept reading Second Corinthians. Well, you know, Hank, I don't know if people ever ask the question, why Jesus had to live on earth 33 and a half years before he would go to the cross? I mean, he was almighty God from his inception uh, when he was one year old, two year old, ten year old, twelve year old, and he was perfect, uh, almighty God, sinless. He could have gone to the cross when he was fifteen or twenty. Why wait till thirty three and a half years? The answer I can tell you is in Hebrews it says he learned obedience through suffering. Jesus had the Almighty God, his will, the same time he had a human will, and he submitted his God will to the perfect man will and listen to only to the Father and do nothing of his own. So he said a million times, I do nothing of my own. I say nothing of my own. I only do what my Father tells me. And that was the Father's will that he, as a man in flesh, learn what it means to say no to himself continually. And finally, he chose to lay down his life on the cross. And I say to people everywhere, if you know this Jesus, he obeyed his father and Jesus said, I send you as my father sent me. So what is the evidence of our being linked with the Father, the Holy Trinity? It is the passion for a world that do not know the Father's love and dying without him. And people don't realize every single day, every time your heart beat, one or more people are dying having never heard the name Jesus. Nearly three billion people live in our generation that never heard Jesus' name, especially in the 1040 window region, like Indian subcontinent and part of Africa and all that. And here is my thinking. How can you go buy a house when the house is on flame and 15 people in the house, they're all going to burn to death and you walk by, you know, whistling and singing a nice, uh, comfortable song? No, you'll be screaming on the top of your lungs saying, please wake up. These people are dying. Come, please help. And that is what St. Paul was doing. So when I say people read the book of Acts, you find people who came to know Christ and became part of the Holy Church. Within days, they were beaten up, persecuted, driven out from their homes. And the Bible says they went everywhere. They went not weeping and mourning about what they lost, but preaching the gospel. A church, as you said to me one time, without Compassion and a mission for the Lord, Great Commission, is a contradiction. This is the reason why many of our churches do not understand, while they understand the truth, they don't understand life is missing and life only comes when we have the legs to walk on and the legs are the book of Acts. Praying, giving, going, sending, like my mother did, six sons, she prayed fasting and crying out to God, one of my sons, oh God, please call him to serve you and serve the Holy Church. And I think the church at large, especially in our world of conservative orthodox beliefs, they are missing the most important teaching of Christ, that is go to those that do not know. You know, 99 Sheep was in the fold, one was lost, and the shepherd left the 99 in the fold and went out searching for the one until he found it. But Hank, now one is in the fold, 
99 out there having never heard the first Christmas story. Why our churches, why our priests, why our leaders don't have a broken heart when 100,000 people die in Bangladesh overnight in the tidal wave, millions are walking around without help. They are people God made in his image. How come our pastors, our priests, and our leaders go to bed that night as so nothing happened? Why the following Sunday there is no weeping and tears and prayer for these people? And I'm telling you, we sometimes we don't understand Jesus is not sitting up in heaven. He's among us weeping for us to be his body, to go, to give and suffer that others may come to know him. And that is the real church and the evidence of pure church. When you're talking, one of the things that occurred to me, KP, is that you have learned, you have been a learner in the classroom of life, and you talk about that and never give up as well. In other words, later on in your ministry, you started to see that the church is the epicenter of the universe, that everything has to revolve around the church, that when people come to faith in Christ, they don't come as Lone Ranger Christians. They have to be baptized. They have to be chrismated. They have to partake of the graces that are available within the context of the church. And as a result of that, you changed your entire ministry focus. You were already very successful as a ministry outreach, but you were willing to change. And when you changed, you paid a price. I did the same thing. When I wrote my book, Truth Matters, Life Matters More, because I was on a journey, that cost me hundreds of radio outlets. But you as I are willing to follow truth wherever it leads and then leave the results up to the Lord. So I want you to talk about that a little bit because you made an epic change in your ministry to make the church the center of your missions. Well, Hank, just imagine a multi-billionaire who kind of became more famous than president of a country or whatever, and finally he goes to the doctor and the most brilliant doctor do all the tests and then come to him privately and whisper in his ear, I just don't know what to tell you, but you just got two weeks to live. This is too late. All of a sudden, the multi-billionaire, he is willing to give away his billions if he could find answer to live, to find cure. And somehow, God in his mercy, and I say that very seriously, when I have written 200 books and uh, possibly our mission became the largest mission, uh, evangelical Protestant mission in the world, uh, with, uh, you know, 15, 20,000 full-time workers and all this stuff going on. And honestly, and I still drove 1962 Volkswagen Bug and uh, live just meeting my basic needs and nothing more I wanted for my life. But it was during this crisis of my faith, the darkest night, where I said, someday I'm going to meet this God, but I don't know him. And this is where my journey began 17 years ago, uh, understanding the Holy Church. And I used to be hypercritical of Catholics and so many people who say, you cannot be saved, you cannot understand God without the Holy Church. And I just couldn't figure this out, although I had the author's background. But then I realized, Ephesians 4, that I can become like Jesus, the deification, the partaking of his nature, the theosis in the local church. That is the reason why the teachers and instructors are given. And all this became so new to me. And that's where I began to think about our mission work and what I'm doing. And I knew uh, very well for me to declare what has happened to me. And of course, you know, we had now, you know, a couple of you know, million people uh, that have come to know the Lord and things were changing so fast. And um, 
I was asked to be the um, consecrated bishop of the church and everything, and I just didn't want to do it, and I went through the crisis. But then that's what actually plunged me to understand or think about the church. What is the seriousness of it? And um, I just went through huge crisis, Hank, knowing that I was on nearly 1,000 radio stations throughout the United States and Europe and everywhere and all kinds of stuff going on. And I was going to be crucified. Uh, but I said to myself, like I told the illustration of the billionaire, I said, I just got a few more years left. What do I want? Opinion and reputation of people. And one of the things the Lord would ask me, uh, do you want to die? Are you willing to die to your reputation and give up all for my sake and for my church? And I would say, yes, Lord, I am. But I didn't understand what that all meant. All of a sudden, hundreds of radio stations dropped us from my radio program, Road to Reality, and thousands of people dropped supporting us as evil people began to write horrible stories about us, which is never true. And so many Christian leaders that I became their mentor and guide, they vanished, wouldn't say a word to me. But in all this, I found the beauty of partaking of the Eucharist and having Jesus real. And I understood that there's no sense in me planting thousands of congregations or churches and to have all these bishops and everything unless we understand the authentic church. Because people gathering and clapping hands and doing all kinds of things is like TED Talk or whatever else. is not church. And that is where I understood the mystery of the holy church and the worship. And I found it was not information but experience. And this reason why, by the way, I do a lots of radio interviews and uh, stuff um, everywhere. And I don't think I have done uh, any interviews since your book came out where I would not mention to people. If there's no reference to what I'm talking about, maybe, but I'll tell them. By the way, something that changed my life is the reading of hundreds and hundreds of books from the early church fathers and all that. But there is one book that I think is better than any other book. Truth Matters, Life Matters More. And I plead with people to get a copy, whatever means, and read it. If they can't, let me know. Because I really think, Hank, uh, honestly, uh, when I first read this book, I didn't fully get it. But second time I read it, now I'm telling every human being I can talk to, day and night, please read this book for your sake, because life here on earth is not uh, going to be forever. You need to know something more than truth. So i terribly excited and appreciate your willingness to put this book in writing and uh, people to read it. And I pray that, um, you know, in heaven there is no wife and husband and children, grandchildren, nothing. The only thing matters is that Jesus and the Holy Trinity and people need to be sober-minded about that because the coronavirus should teach all of us we have no guarantee about tomorrow. It's better to know him and sacrifice everything in the world to be his. And that's what this book is all about that you wrote. And of course, you know, in my book, Never Give Up, I talk about uh, my journey, which actually explained very well in terms of truth and life in your book. You know, one of the things, and by the way, thank you so much for those kind words about truth matters, life matters more. And I know that you wrote a letter and sent it out to uh, pastors all over the world to get this book, but it's humbling that you would do that. And I feel the same way about your writings and certainly about your ministry. But I want to go back to something you were talking about earlier, KP. You were talking about, in your book, you write about it as well. You're talking about going back to the early church. And I thought there was a powerful analogy in your book, A Never Give Up, about how important it is to go back to the place where the stream is not polluted. And you use this illustration of being a kid and jumping into the river with your friends and you could see the bottom, but now you go back to that same river and it's polluted. But 
Maybe you should tell the illustration. I mean, it's beautiful when you go back to the beginning, to the genesis of that river, it's clear and crystal. And that's the same thing you use as an analogy for going back to when the church was young. You know, Hank, I'm so glad you brought it up because really, you know, it's an emotional thing with me because this was one of the things in my journey to understand the holiness and the mystery of the Holy Church the Lord used in one of my week of silence and prayer um, helped me to go back kind of regressing as a tiny boy growing up by this uh, river and we have you know hundreds of coconut trees they are tall and many of these coconut trees grow leaning toward the river and uh, the river is still there and I remember as a three four year old little kid uh, we used to climb on these uh, leaning over the river coconut trees and just get about you know 10 meters 20 meters uh, into you know half way to the tree and then we jump into the river but here's a funny thing from the tree we could see the bottom of the river I mean, you're talking about 30, 40 uh, feet or 20 feet, so clear uh, sand, crystal clear water. And uh, we used to swim, and that's my life was, you know, growing up in that village. But uh, 30, 40 years would go by. Uh, I still go to my village uh, once in a while to visit uh, there. That river, Hank, you will not want to wash your hands in it. You don't want to swim in it. It is so dark, so polluted. Because those days when I was growing up, there were no houses on both sides of the river as it is now. Now there are thousands. And people dump all the dirt and stuff into the river and it's totally polluted. But one time I talked about it to someone and they said, you know what, this river starts not here. It starts on the foothills. And they explain about the mountain ranges where the river starts. And they explained to me that if you go there, still the water is pure as crystal glass. And um, trees grow very beautiful there and plants in the river and all those things. And the Lord reminded me of that during my search and said, Son, what is happening? Over the period of thousands of years, people have thrown in their man-made doctrines and interpretations and subjective reasoning. And particularly, I would say, as a student of church history, it all began in 15th, 16th century, uh, the recent based theology that caused so much damage to the church that the fear of God completely missing. And um, uh, a preacher who wears jeans with holes in it, runs back and forth with uh, flashing lights and all the neons and all those things. And, you know, people think obedience to God is the mark of spirituality. I say, no, that is the beginning. But fear of God is understanding who God is. And that's what happened in the life of Abraham. So today, the church at large, I'm not talking about church in America or Europe or anywhere. I mean, in Europe, you know, I was there in England a few months ago. Every week, Hank, one church is sold to Hindus or Muslims or bars, and they're closing down those churches. And, you know, what is a holy church? The audience is not the preacher. For 1,500 years, there was no pulpit for the man to be brilliant and the music group and the band and all that. It is not entertainment. God is the audience. And the altar was the center where people gathered around to partake of the invisible Christ who now represented or in the Eucharist. These things are now false teaching for the modern church. And I think if anyone care about eternity, and I have the statement I make all the time, please live in the light of eternity. Fear God because no one is going to support you and you don't care about the millions you make now or the aeroplanes No, It is too serious. And Jesus is coming back for his bride. And I do not know where this theology came from, but I have 
uh, sadness about it that you just say a word of prayer and um, and live a moral life and you are now uh, going to heaven. And this is quite serious. And this is the reason why the churches need to understand what church is so that we can represent God in the right way to the humanity that we are uh, speaking to. You started a church movement and it really is centered in the whole concept of mission. You, I'll quote this from your book. I just looked it up on page 128. You say, we went out to do the Great Commission as was done by the apostles and hundreds of local churches were born as a result of it. And then you say, a true biblical mission never remains a mission. It will always transform itself into a church, and those churches will then send out more and more missionaries. So here you start the church, because you see that the people have to go into the church, they have to partake of the Eucharist. When they partake of the Eucharist, they receive a grace that empowers them. They then go out into the world and they become reproducing disciple makers and multiplication happens. In fact, you just wrote a new book. And that new book is about our orthodox moment, that what happened in the book of Acts and that Same thing happening now in India and in Myanmar and in Bangladesh and in other countries in this 1040 window. That same thing can happen all over the world, and we can reach those who have not heard, but not just reach them, incorporate them into the body of Christ so that they can partake of the reincarnation of Eden, the place in which we can have access to the tree of life replete with its Eucharistic bounty. So you're concerned that those people not just experience eternity, but experience the abundant life now, the abundant life that allows them to go out and become reproducing disciple makers. Well, you know, Hank, think about it. If local churches were not the goal, the ultimate objective of the Lord Jesus Christ when he sent out his disciples, or for Jesus being sent to earth, then there will not be book of Romans, nor any of the New Testament books, nor the book of Revelation. Because when Jesus said, go and preach the gospel, in Acts chapter 2, we see they did it, church was born. Then you see in Antioch, the church having their worship and the Holy Spirit uh, speak saying that uh, send out these two men as missionaries to preach the gospel. And um, St. Paul and his co-worker goes and preach the gospel. This is exactly what we see happen. As a matter of fact, you know, one year we had several thousands of young people who wanted to be now seminaries, but we didn't have the space to take them. Where do they come from? They come from the churches that we planted and parents praying that one of their children will go and serve God, which is one of our you know, teaching in all our churches. Every believer, every Christian ought to be going and sending. And uh, the sending part, you can send one of your children or anyone in the community who want to go and serve God. And if that be the case, uh, you can imagine um, here in an authentic church, they'll be going to McDonald's or uh, whatever place they go, and they always be talking about The most important thing in life, the living Lord Jesus Christ, invite them to come to church and experience the life of God. So, you know, in in the book I write about it, um, especially the new book, that is, it is extremely important we understand uh, that the Great Commission is uh, for specific purpose to see people come to Christ and they are introduced to understand the life of God and the Eucharist and teaching and all that. And from that church, they then begin to reach out the others in the community and in the near culture and cross-culturally. And um, like our churches in uh, Myanmar, they send um, half a dozen work missionaries from there to uh, neighboring countries. And one country where I cannot mention the name but uh, in that country they have won uh, several thousand people to the Lord and these men 
uh, from Miami or went there with the instruction from our Archbishop, you are being sent with a one-way ticket. You are not coming back to the country again. You go there, live there, die there for the people, to those people the church is sending you. And this is not imagination. It's a real reality I'm talking about. And this is what church should be doing all over the world because this is how us... You know, you talked about, we talked about it. If all the churches would do this, we can see the whole world come to Christ in our lifetime. Yeah, absolutely. I wrote about that in the foreword to your book, which is, I don't know if it's out yet or when it's coming out, but the book, Our Orthodox Moment, which is something I want to talk to you about in a future podcast, because that's a very significant book as well. Yeah, as a matter of fact, right now it is in the final proofreading process. It should go to press within a couple of weeks, I think. Going back to Never Give Up, there's an epigraph by A.W. Tozer that says, In many churches, Christianity has been watered down until the solution is so weak that if it were poison, it wouldn't hurt anyone. And if it were medicine, it would not cure anyone. And I want you to talk about that by way of an illustration in your book, Never Give Up, in which you talk about purchasing a hospital in South Asia. And then you discover that 50% of the medicines were not authentic. And this for you is an analogy for the church, the church that gives weekly doses of positive thinking or TED Talks, as you put it earlier, but isn't allowing people to experience the graces that can transform them in the present. Yeah, Hank, um, you know, this is a strange statement for me to make, but for me, I think having no fear of God and uh, being so self-centered is immorality. And, you know, in the churches at large, people define immorality in a different ways. But um, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very serious thing. And, of course, that illustration is a real thing. One of our dioceses decided to purchase um, a hospital. Somebody was selling it so they can reach the community and help the poor and needy and um, helpless. And, of course, you know, after they bought the hospital, they had, um, you know, some specialists to come in and inspect the entire hospital and the um, department where they give out the medicines and everything. And they found out uh, that 50 percent of the medicines were fake. They were not real. And the people who owned it earlier, uh, they were making tons of money because of that. And, of course, you know, they destroyed all that fake medicines and changed everything. And um, here's the thing. Uh, this is only an example I'm telling you. Now, um, when I was a clergy here in Dallas during um, and after my seminary for four and a half years, every Wednesday, Hank, I had set apart uh, three hours for people of my congregation to come for counseling. I had 200 some families in the congregation. It was a small church. And they would come to me with you know, appointment and with all kind of problems and everything else. And of course, and I'd tell them whatever I knew and all that. But our churches are filled with Christian counselors, yet, think about it, half of the congregations are divorced, broken homes. What happened to us? The early church, confession was a sacrament. And in psychology tells us, and everybody knows this, that you can figure out everything about your life and mistakes and blunders and sins and everything, but there's one thing there's no cure for, that is guilt. Only God can erase the guilt. How does that happen? Through God's forgiveness. And how did that happen in the church for a thousand years? It was the sheep, the people in the church could come to the priest, the clergy, and with absolute confidence, even if he got killed, he will never reveal those things he hear. And just like Nathan would talk to David after they confess and talk to the Lord and the priest hear it, and, and on the behalf of the Lord, he's able to say, your sins are forgiven, your guilt is removed, live in peace, and 
live for the Lord, things like that. You know, we changed everything in the church such a way that God is uh, no more in the picture. Uh, C.S. Lewis said it, God now is in the dock. We are the ones to decide what is the answer to human problems and crisis and all that. And we are falling apart. There is no answer. I mean, why on earth you want to say America is a post-Christian nation, yet to be boast about it, and we fight about doctrines, yet we do not have the life of God. And the blame is the, is the church, the pulpit. And um, this is the reason why, you know, I'm always concerned about the body of Christ all over the world. And what I write, what I say, um, has everything to do with the same thing you are doing. And I'm, I'm saying, you know, somebody said, what is holiness? It is honesty. To God say, God, I just want you to know, this is what I am. I don't know you. Help me. And I think if our people become honest about the heart condition, I think God will have great mercy on us and lead us to truth. And, you know, um, Judas denied Christ, so did Apostle Peter. Even God could not save Judas. Peter's faith was weak and he was honest. And he said, Lord, I don't know what to tell you. You know me. But Judas, his faith was deceptive. They are not honest uh, but pretending. And that is the damning thing for Christianity. And the call of God is to come to understand Him. And the way we understand it, for my life at least, uh, maybe is different for somebody else. It was, like I said, reading the church fathers and the saints of old, the desert fathers, desert mothers, and um, the days and weeks of being quiet and silent before him, uh, just to know God and understand him. These are not complicated matters. These are simple things, but we just are so independent from God that we are to fight for doctrines and not for God, but for our own image and uh, salary and position and reputation. Yeah, that is well said. And you bring this up in the context of strange fire of course, written about in Leviticus chapter 10, where the fire goes out from the Lord and devours them. The story is about those who bring not authentic fire, but strange fire. And when you think of strange fire in this context, in the context in which you're using it in the book, you're looking very clearly and closely at the fruit of the heretic who is not bringing the authentic fire of the Lord, but a strange fire. And in the Old Testament, there was a penalty for that. That was a very severe penalty. And I think if that penalty was still in vogue today, we would see people dying in pulpits all around the world. But I want to move away from that for just a few moments here, because I think it's important to talk about your passion for the poor and the downtrodden. If it weren't for the coronavirus, you and I would be in India right now and some of the countries in the 1040 window, including Myanmar and Bangladesh and so forth. But we're going to be doing that again in the near future. If I were in India with you, I would see some of the things that you are doing as the means to reach people. You give them a loaf of bread, you give them a warm blanket, and then you earn the right to tell them, about your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so you have established the order of Sisters of Compassion, a Bridge of Hope Centers. The Bridge of Hope Centers, for example, care for tens of thousands of children who otherwise would grow up to become beggars. The Order of Sisters of Compassion. This is an order that provides aid among the slums, among those that are in leprosy, colonies. All of these are significant works. There are almost 300,000 women receiving free health care training, 62,000 learning to read and write through the Gospel for Asia literacy classes, over a thousand medical camps. I, mean, I think a thousand with all those other numbers doesn't sound too big, but these are conducted in needy communities to help 
care for tens of thousands of people. You're drilling thousands of wells. You call them Jesus wells. The warm blankets that I talked about before, the 70,000 children being helped through the Bridge of Hope program, all of these programs, they are going on in the present. And through these programs, you are reaching people. If I recall, you say in your book there was a time in which you didn't think that social work was mission work, but you've repented of that because you realize that social work can be used as the bridge into mission work. You can probably explain this a lot better than I can. Well, you know, Hank, this is true. There was in the beginning of GFA, by the way, Gospel for Asia World, as we are known now, is actually a part of the order of the uh, Believers Eastern Church. Uh, just as in the book of Acts, you know, you do mission work, then the church becomes the leader. So that's where we are. But um, this was my um, hardcore, you know, all Orthodox, uh, sorry, Protestant days when I thought the whole world is going to hell. The only answer is prayer, the sinner's prayer, and receive Christ. And I, I was totally opposed to any social work, and I wrote against it and um, became a champion of that. But I remember one time I was in Mumbai, a city with 17 million people. I was waiting to catch my Lufthansa flight to Frankfurt, and I picked up this newspaper, and right on the front of the newspaper was a huge black and white photograph of a little boy semi-naked laying on the street corner and beside him lays a large female dog and the little boy is nursing on the dog, drinking the milk from the dog. And the caption under the picture went like this, this dog is his mother. And the three-column article explained about 100,000 children that live on the streets of Calcutta and Mumbai or more, not knowing where their parents are, who their parents are, they live and die there and things like that. And um, it stopped me instantly and said, what if that happened to be me laying there on the street? What do I want? And uh, several incidents took place like that where, you know, God is so amazing, Hank, so gracious and merciful and loving. He never condemned me and, and beat me up. He gently spoke to my heart continually saying that, you know, you, you need to understand all people are my creation. All people are are mine. I love them. And you are supposed to be living Jesus now to them, giving them food and clothes and care for them and express my love for them. And um, I was scared to death because by now I was known very, very much for radical uh, edge of just preaching the gospel and uh, attack all the groups who are doing social work and all that. And I was afraid my own staff in the United States and Europe will turn against me. But in the end, I said, I need to go public and repent. And so I repented and said, God, forgive me for my blindness. And we began to help the poor and needy. And the things you said is literally true and much more. We have these Sisters of Compassion that uh, our 500 sisters trained just like Mother Teresa's uh, sisters. Uh, they are the ones who actually trained our people. Uh, we have 500 plus sisters like that working in 42 leper colonies, you know, caring for them and loving them and uh, working on the 42 million widows, women who are completely lost and hopeless. And uh, these 70,000 children, Hank, that is nothing when you think about 62 million children that are living on the streets in these nations. And our dream is to help at least 500,000 children. And this year, 2,000 plus children graduated from their high school, from our homes, and uh, they found a new life, and not only for this life, but the life to come. And uh, what we do is only a, a drop in the bucket, but much more. The need is so awesome and so great that if only we can do more. But I cannot imagine someone who says, 
I want to serve God and do great commission and have no compassion for the poor and the needy. Uh, right now, you know, just a few weeks ago, I came back to States in March. Hank, somebody sent me a photograph and I just looked at it and alone in my room, I just cried and cried. The photograph happened to be um, this four, five, six-year-old little boy um, just got enough clothes to, you know, cover his nakedness and in his lap sits maybe a six, seven-month-old little baby boy, totally naked. They're hugging each other. Both are weeping. And um, the story of that photograph is Mumbai or Bombay, 24 hours, you have literally millions of people, 24 hours. But after the corona coronavirus, the streets became completely empty. No cars, no train, no aeroplanes, and nobody on the road. And I imagined the hundreds of thousands of children on the streets begging to make a living. And these two kids happened to be two of those children. They are sitting and weeping on the street corner. And I said to myself, how many more? are going to weep and die like this until the church care about it and do something about it. And I thank God we have thousands and thousands of our congregations are now involved 24 hours cooking meals and helping these people. India's problem in Nepal and Bangladesh, Hank, is not coronavirus. It is starvation. People are starving to death. And... Um, Two weeks ago, I heard about uh, from a social worker on the media, a mother throwing five of her children into the river and uh, trying to kill herself because starvation. And uh, at this time, the church need to be uh, alerted and do everything they can. And it is during this time the um, horrible typhoon that hit Bangladesh and Assam and those places were um, hurting a lot of people. And the world is in terrible suffering. And I think uh, we, those who are able, uh, we need to uh, embrace suffering, which also means fasting and praying for a day or two for the suffering people of the world and give what we can to help feed the poor and needy and all that because there's one church we have uh, in one place uh, where the coronavirus hit so bad they are feeding 500 people a day the entire church cook 500 meals a day and provide thank God for the government officials and the police everybody helping us to do these things because without the help we cannot do it but the, the crisis in these nations are only starting and that's where I'm concerned about that uh, we will go out and do more right now in the name of Jesus because this is where God's love is seen and felt and experienced uh, by people that are in trouble. Now, I think you've elaborated on this in many different venues, but I think it'd be good in this podcast as well. The quote by St. John Chrysostom, who said, and this is so poignant and profound, he said, the rich exist for the sake of the poor. The poor exist for the salvation of the rich. Can you expand upon that? Yeah, you know, I used to say this to people. You never asked to be born in America or Canada or uh, in a Syrian Christian home in uh, south of India, like my case, or in any place. You, you never said, God, oh, okay, you, be, you allow me to be born in America and I will do this. No, we are where we are, born and raised by the grace and mercy of God. And the Bible says, to those much is given, much shall be required. And, um, you know, I'm of the opinion that all humanity stamped on our hearts the image of God. We are made in His image. And it is our responsibility of our soulish decision to do what our emotions and heart says, the compassion and the kindness toward other people. And uh, when a church 
decides that their main uh, job is to build a bigger building and put the best carpet and um, you know take care of their needs and forget half of the world go to bed with empty stomach and naked bodies half of the world have never seen one page of the holy scripture and uh, they never heard about Jesus i think we should take care of our churches nicely and have a nice carpet and live clean and drive clean nice car i'm not against all but once we forget uh, we are here in this world for a short time for the sake of christ and always this says the poor heard the gospel heard jesus gladly and our greatest opportunity in our lifetime here on earth is to look not wait look for opportunities where we can invest our prayers our fasting our uh, resources our children and all that you know how many families got their children studying to be medical doctors how many are medical doctors why can't they think about taking two three weeks off and go to uh, some other country and serve the poor and help um, how many families are taking vacation and going to holy land and all kind of places and in seven star resorts why don't they take their money and take their two three kids and go to uh, mexico city Uh, or to dhaka bangladesh or nepal or india and let these children walk through the slums and see the thousands of children dying and playing in the dark murky sewage and drinking the water and um, experience reality the lost world uh, that they don't think that living in america or england or canada is uh, all about life i think uh, parents uh, from our congregation should take their children to people who are living on the streets under the bridges in new york and chicago and wherever and i think the we need to come down to the level of basic humanity that survive whether you're rich or poor for so short time but use our resources why do somebody had to spend $200,000 to buy a car when they could get one for $50,000 because car is not where you live that is to transport your body from one place to another place and um, thousands of things we we can do i mean remember saint paul said in philippians chapter 1 when people were weeping about him being in prison uh, he said hey just don't worry about it he said all these things happened to me for the furtherance of the gospel that means his looking glass everything about his life he evaluated with one thing how can this help others to hear about the lord jesus christ and understand him whether they are in america or in china or india or anywhere in the world and this should be christ like in our life here the result of our divine liturgy and eucharist and all these things that is very important in knowing the life of god i want you to in the time we have left talk a little bit about your book revolution world missions i alluded to it earlier but this is a book that has been translated into so many different languages over 4 million copies in print But what's important to me at this point is for people to understand what this revolution is all about. What do you mean a revolution in world mission and how can we become part of that revolution? It's very simple, Hank. You know, in uh, Acts chapter 17 it says about the early Christians Uh, my god here comes these people who turn the world upside down in one translation the world revolutionaries have come here also and in my book the world revolution i use to show that 80% 80 percent of the countries of the world are completely closed or restricted for outsiders to come as missionaries to preach and plant churches and uh, time has changed uh, since the second world war what we should do is to find the body of christ in these nations and help them because they are poor and they are hurting and we should assist them to train their own workers and help them to go and uh, preach the gospel and after they plant local churches they become self supporting and uh, so the biggest revolution we need to see is the question hank is not how we are going to reach 
the unreached in our world, the question must be, how are they going to hear the gospel? And if that be the way we look at it, we will come alongside with the brothers and sisters in all these nations, like in China, uh, and help them because uh, they don't have the resources to print the million Bibles they need and all kind of things, or so dig clean water wells for the poor, needy people and all that. And the book Revolution World Missions, um, by the way, it is free for anyone to get. It's a 220-page book um, written for in simple language, and um, it's almost 5 million copies now in print in all kind of languages. Uh, somebody can go to gfa.org, uh, gospelforasia.org, and ask for a free copy without any obligation. We will send it to them. And also by going to our website, they can get plenty of information about how they can become part of changing our world. Jesus came to change the world. He was a revolutionary, and we need to be. And um, also, Hank, we have uh, what do you call the school of discipleship. Young people who finish their high school, they can come and spend one year at our you know, 700-acre campus here to live here and learn on the job what it means to know God and pray and um, then later they go to the university uh, college or whatever else and all over the world and so this is one of the main contribution that I believe the Lord wants us to do to serve the church uh, here in uh, North America and we don't make money on this thing. They, we, we just tell them you know all it takes is just um, have enough money to you know buy your food. You can we give you house to stay and places and you be part of a community uh, where uh, you really understand the meaning of church and uh, knowing God and living for him uh, during our life here on earth. And you get some kind of a vision as well and that vision captivates your life. For example, you've often spoken about the deletes. A lot of people wouldn't know what that is, but here you have a people group that may number as much as 300 million people, 250 to 300 million people. And they're considered outcasts. They're not even part of the caste system. They're outside the caste system. They can't drink from the water of those who are part of the caste system in places like India. And these people are being proselytized by Buddhists and by Muslims, and the church is woefully ignorant to their plight. These are people created in the image and likeness of God that form a very open mission field, people that can be reached, that can be invigorated by the very notion that they are not outcasts in the eyes of Jesus Christ, that they are the salt of the earth, that they can be transformed, that they can go from one glory to another. In 2 Corinthians, it says, with unveiled face. So this is part of the mission. And when you start to see this part of the mission, when you start to learn about it, your whole life turns upside down. And when you see those needs and when you see those opportunities, I think your own light and momentary problems begin to fade. Yeah, you know... Hank, just imagine, you know, your dad and mom, uh, they got a five-year-old daughter or son who is so beautiful, but uh, they are crippled. They, they, this kid cannot stand up and walk and just crawl like a little uh, animal. Uh, but all of a sudden, instantly, they see that young daughter or son completely healed. They are restored to perfect health. There's no language can describe the excitement, the beauty, and the surprise of that. You know, Hank, uh, when I was studying in school as a four-year-old, five-year-old little kid, um, you know, first grade, second grade, we carried what you call a writing slate and the stone that you write uh, on it. And uh, in the classroom, there is a blackboard, they call it, and you write with a chalk and you wipe it. And every time you write, uh, you have to wipe again. And then the more you write on it, the more dim uh, that uh, blackboard becomes. Dalits or the untouchables hang our clean slate, clean paper, 
they are innocent when i was in nepal i never forget meeting uh, the head of one of the dalit group uh, some 60 million people scattered uh, throughout the subcontinent and he is the chief leader of this group and he said to me almost in tears incidentally this guy was educated in the united states in harvard or somewhere and uh, but he wears um, clothes identify with these uh, people uh, untouchables and he said 90% of our children never go to school we are slaves of the upper caste we always will be will you come please teach our children educate our people and you teach us about your jesus a new way of life whatever but we want to get out of the slavery um hank that is the story not of one group of people but thousands group thousands and jesus came to set the captives free but romans 10 says how will they believe in him if they have not heard his name how they how they will hear his name unless somebody tell them and how will they tell about jesus unless somebody go and the last question how will somebody go unless we send them somebody who's living in new jersey or dallas or london or you know in toronto or anywhere in the world or in south india they can actually be in one place never move out of the room and be a sender through prayer and giving for people to go everywhere preaching the gospel you know my mother hank never left my community 84 years of life but from that little village she was helping hundreds of young people to go to bible school serve god in different places where she never been to but today i must tell you she is not dead she is with jesus and she can see me now you are not talking about it she is a cloud of great witnesses and she is saying my son you don't understand what this all about keep doing keep running the race and tell everyone about your lord and help the poor and needy and this is beautiful life and this is beautiful orthodoxy well the book never give up by kp johanan is available all this month and in fact any time you want it it is available to those that support our ministry and vicariously the ministry of gospel for asia you can get your copy for your support on the web at equip.org we'll also be happy to send you revolution in world mission or you can get these resources through gospel for asia as kp just talked about we have been working behind the scenes on a number of projects together and my love and admiration for KP and for his ministry knows no bounds it continues to grow the more i see the more i interact with this ministry and this incredible ministry leader the more i love him and the more i love his work and the more i want to be involved in what the lord has raised him up to do in your book KP you say you want to leave the reader with a request and then you give that request and i thought it would be a perfect way to end this podcast that request is please learn to live your life every minute of it in light of eternity and this is something that you teach to your priests that you teach to your bishops that you teach to those who are part of eastern believers church those that are involved in ministry with you to live every minute of your life in light of eternity and in fact in light of that you also have been so gracious to be praying for me for my life for my health uh, i've been going through radiation treatments as you know i've just gone through 11 of them i have four more to go through not for a life threatening cancer a secondary cancer that came as a result of my transplant 
But I want to thank you for that reminder, that request. Please learn to live your life, every minute of it, in light of eternity. And also want to thank you for your prayers on my behalf. You know, Hank, you didn't ask me to say this to anyone, but since I met you and been praying for you, one of the important things happened to me in my relationship with you is uh, the words of St. Paul. He said, you know what, (laughs) honestly, I don't care about being here on earth. This is really dumb and stupid. So many problems. I'd rather be with the Lord. But for your sake, I will stay around some more time. The weird thing happened to me in my relationship with you in prayer is that the Lord impressed upon my heart to pray for you daily. And um, he specifically said, pray that Hank will have health and long life to serve uh, the Holy Church and the lost world. And that's what I do every single day. And I would ask our audience, please join in prayer if you can every single day for Hank Hanograph. You know, people are made saints after they are dead. But I tell you, there are a few saints that are walking around, but we need to recognize. And I think God's hand is on your life. And you proved that by paying the price, as St. Paul did. And I think we need to have thousands of people praying for you and for your health and long life because so much to be done in our world. And you are one of those key people I really believe God picked uh, to turn the light on for a world that is so much in need and darkness. Okay, Pete, thank you so much for those words. And, of course, I feel the exact same thing. With respect to you, I do pray for you on a daily basis. I pray for gospel for Asia. And uh, honestly, I feel like our ministries have been yoked just like our lives have been yoked. And I can't wait to spend some time with Believer's Eastern Church in India and in Myanmar, and see your seminaries, and the hospital, and all the things that you are doing, and whatever the way the Lord can lead me to help further your work. It's not our work, it's not my work or your work, it's the Lord's work. But whatever way the Lord can use me in that process, I'm all in. And I want to thank you so much for spending your time on this podcast, your passion, The clarity with which you are communicating a message and sharing a vision is intoxicating, and we're all very grateful for it. Thank you, Hank. Blessings on you, and love you very much. Appreciate you so much. Mutual, and for everyone tuning in, thank you so much for making Hank Unplugged possible. This is the 100th edition of Hank Unplugged, and it couldn't come with a more inspirational, informative individual than K.P. Yohanan, the Ministry for Gospel for Asia, Believer's Eastern Church. The work that they are doing is simply incredible, and to be a small part of that is a great blessing for the Christian Research Institute. We'll continue working together. Our lives have been intertwined, and we'll be sharing many more broadcasts and podcasts and sharing with you the work and how you can be involved in that work prayerfully and financially. So thanks so much for tuning in to this edition of Hank Unplugged. Look forward to seeing you next time with more of the podcast.